So what I'd like to talk about today is the Athshan part of a longer forthcoming work of mine that considers Le Guin's interweaving of the political and the metaphysical. One interesting expression of that political and metaphysical synthesis is her take on the proto-anarchism of the Tao. Against the grain of much academic scholarship on anarchism, which generally represents anarchism as a modern and a rationalist movement, Le Guin is comfortable setting the two in easy proximity. Now, in fairness to Le Guin, she's careful in her language, not equating anarchism and Taoism exactly, but describing the former as, quote, prefigured in early Taoist thought and expounded by Shelley and Kropotkin, Goldman and Goodman, end of quote. Now, this is a hugely important statement indicative of someone for whom the agrarian human cooperation, and radically democratic social systems are what we might call naturalized features of existence, while their opposites, industrial exploitation, hierarchy, and the state, are something like deviations. But nor is Le Guin's highly naturalized anarchism in its accord with the Tao by any means an irrational mysticism. Rather, she makes her satians, the Arasti and Anaresti people, developers of the Ansible, a people for whom precisely the rational world of mathematics is a source of religious contemplation. So in this sense, I'm talking about um, not just the dream of uh, the people of Ashe, but sort of a broader sense of dreaming. The naturalism of the agrarian, cooperation, and radical democracy doesn't prevent, however, their opposites of exploitation, hierarchy, and the state from spiraling out of balance. On Othshe, the forest world, such deviations are, while unnatural, also self-perpetuating. Delusion overcomes dream. Not only the Athshan's talent for dreaming as part of a rejection of personally violent, let alone colonialist behavior, but also, unfortunately, delusion overcomes dream in the rational optimism and connectedness, uh, relationality, we might say, embodied in the Ansible. I'd like to talk about the self-perpetuation and irrationalism of such imbalance and do what I can to relate it meaningfully to the practice of mutual aid. So upon receiving the 2014 medal for distinguished contribution to American letters, Le Guin uttered these words that have become well-traveled almost a mantra in certain circles of her readers, those most sympathetic to leftist values and aims. And if you'll all indulge me, uh, you may well have heard it before, I'll read the quote in context. Quote, books aren't just commodities. The profit motive is often in conflict with the aims of art. We live in capitalism, its power seems inescapable, but then so did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change, often begin in art, very often in our art, the art of words, end of quote. Now, instantly and intuitively resonant to many who have savored Le Guin's talent for reimagining social possibilities otherwise taken for granted, this likening of capitalism to the divine right of kings is still, I would say, worth closer analysis. The apparent but specious transient human power mistaken for some immutable law is a recurrent theme in Le Guin's works, generally, and in particular, the Hainish works, her science fiction novels, novellas, and stories connected loosely to one another by themes related to the drama of intercultural encounters within an interstellar community. Or between, if we were to imagine scaling up Wallerstein's world systems analysis, the interstellar community is core, semi-periphery, and periphery. Uh, true to the anthropological orientation that is second nature to Le Guin, given her father, many of these intercultural encounters have some of the flavor of an ethnographic expedition where fundamental expectations of both visitors and octothonous planetary residents are challenged, if not inverted, in either direction. With such fundamentals as gender dynamics, linguistic expression, economic organization, or the role of religious practice, the characters are often challenged fundamentally to reimagine what they have taken for granted. In this way, Le Guin's reflection on the divine power of kings seems a particularly vivid example of an observation famously made more broadly by Graeber, who says, quote, the ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something that we make and could just as easily make differently, end of quote. It is with this contingent, ephemeral, or normative, as opposed to fixed, eternal, or naturalistic idea of social orders in mind, that I turn to Le Guin's The Word for World is Forest, 
I find this novella uh, a, an interesting outlier in the Hainish works, not in content, but in execution. Not just that is for its capturing of a bitter Vietnam War zeitgeist or its stark contrast against the film Avatar, but for its presentation, unusual in the Hainish works, I have read, uh, most of them at this point, of an active extractivist colonial presence on an alien world. So extractivism in the interstellar economy. I must admit, I find this novella an emotionally difficult read. One of its several emotionally repulsive elements is its background of an interstellar form of extractivism with the products of clear-cutting logging shipped a distance of light years back to Earth to satisfy the market of a planet presumably no longer possessed of any forests at all, nor capable of satisfying a money economy's market for natural wood by other means. In my emotional struggle, I admit I am also being challenged, like Le Guin's characters, to re-examine a conviction I take for granted in the real world, that no planetary society could survive intact, let alone extend its reach to the stars without first systematically overcoming its hierarchical and exploitative uh, tendencies. Instead, Earth, as we learn elsewhere in the Hainish works, has pursued an unrelenting course of social and ecological devastation just as plausible in our day as in Le Guin's writing of this book. That degradation of the Earth environment evidently has not prevented its inhabitants from settler colonial projects at presumably great trouble and expense, with clear-cutting logging on the forest planet as part of a nearly as fast as light colonial shipping project. Among this novella's near contemporaries in the world of science fiction, I'm also reminded of the premise of the first alien movie whose protagonists are returning from a routine corporate interstellar mining operation. I remember such an idea always striking me as woefully implausible. It clashes with my own type of post-scarcity Star Trek style utopianism, where a crossing of the matter energy barrier makes items much more effective simply to fabricate or replicate than to travel worlds away seeking raw materials. But unfortunately, as I write this from the perspective of late 2022, the prospect of interstellar extractivism, I will begrudgingly admit, feels the more resonant modern myth, if not the more likely real outcome in immediately future centuries than does a post-scarcity society. I need mention only a few examples that contribute to this picture, the accelerating rate of forest clear cutting, the corporation as a clear successor to the state and space exploration, and possibly interplanetary colonization, and the tendency for a capitalist system to, if left in place, seek out or invent Baroque new markets, and especially luxury markets. Although not directly depicted, one has no difficulty imagining the earth contemporaneous to the events in the word for world is forest, as a place where natural wood is a luxury commodity available at astronomical prices only to a ruling elite, while the majority population continues to suffer terrible dehumanization and trauma of its own. It is sadly the extractivist logic that seems the more plausible, though obviously insensible, while my own vision of a post-scarcity future, while the more sensible, has instead the persistent, haunting, quality of what Mark Fisher observed to be a lost future. It is quite sadly the limitless inflation of luxury good prices that makes the ruining of worlds a profitable, though abominable, venture. My sense of what naturally should be, my dream sense, is grossly offended by what likely would be the delusion sense, given present speed and trajectory. Another observation of David Graeber comes to mind in the documentary series Capitalism, and I'm sure he's made this argument elsewhere as well, where he reasons that many historical arguments are on a false basis. Notably, the question of why Europe was in a position to conquer the world is not the right question, so much as the question of why Europe was even motivated to do so in contrast with other seafaring civilizations. It is in this spirit that the people of Earth are portrayed as outliers among interstellar civilizations. Though a number have formally joined that association of known worlds Le Guin here calls the ecumen, None are portrayed as having quite so savage and ruinous a proclivity toward exploitation as the people of Earth. The tragedy in this outlook is also compounded by the relative lack of salutary effect upon the colonists' behavior, whether from the influence of other presumably less exploitative civilizations or later in the narrative from the ruling powers of Earth itself. Le Guin offers a cautionary tale in how this dynamic is portrayed. An alliance that is an admixture of greater and lesser colonial impulses easily becomes as destructive as its worst constituent member allows it to be. 
This is an unfortunate tendency that, in my experience with the practice of mutual aid, holds true at the level of municipalist work, uh, motivated by the likes of Bookchin and others, just as I imagine it does in projects of internationalist solidarity. Although Earth is a member of the newly formed ecumen, colonists are neither answerable to it nor even to Earth itself. The damage has already been done in the fact that the colonial project was allowed to proceed to begin with. Um, there's a bit more that I'll just simply summarize um, about the Ansible principle. Um, apparently, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, Le Guin derived it from answerable, but of course Davidson is in no way, shape or form answerable to the directives, the commands that start coming in, um, referring to them as phonies, right? And so in this sense, Davidson um, really embodies the sense of the uh, classic study from the 1940s about the fascist agitator, right? That he's motivated really not so much uh, by reasoning as by an other, by an enemy that has to be eradicated, um, by uh, you know no consistent sense of ideals. One minute in his, his inner narrative, oh, well, they just got the Ansible principle from us, from Earth. It was an ICD and they stole it. Oh no, it's a fake Ansible. So very reminiscent of the idea of fake news. Um, and I just summarized that for the sake of time. So I'd like to venture to transpose these insights a little bit onto the practice of mutual aid. And if we follow uh, a vision of one like Kropotkin's naturalizing the practice of mutual aid as, as something of a background in which autochthonous communities tend to participate before the imposition of an economy, then this gives us some kind of sense of how mutual aid might in some ways be practiced just as a, a, a sort of naturalized reclamation and regaining of that sort of natural state of affairs. The danger, of course, being that when violence is imposed, as we've seen in the novella and through these, these many wonderful reflections, that, that tragedy and that act of uh, violent rebellion, in contrast with Avatar, which, by the way, I, I still haven't seen. I meant to catch um, in the theater. In the, the, I, just, I never bothered seeing it. Um, and maybe somebody can correct me if there's something really worth seeing in Avatar. But um, to think of the practice of mutual aid in our communities, and just to relate the insights from the novel to that, we've seen a little bit of uh, you know putting forth rational, compassionate arguments of um, taking some of the directives that that come down from the ecumen and looking at them not as prohibitions, um, but more something as affirmation. Right. So rather the, the the first prohibition coming from the ecumen that you shall not, you know, initiate any contact unless the Athshans have first asked for it. Um, relating that to the principle of mutual aid practice in communities, whether it's with the unhoused, whether it's with neighbors generally, uh, the affirmation of working with individuals and with communities and with contact between unknown communities with that sense of humility and with that sense of deferring deference um, to their their wishes and their own uh, you know inner inner sense of well being and what their particular needs are, um, and then to sort of conclude um, with this sense as we see the ecumen develop from the word for world as forest, there is a quote and I don't remember which novel it is where it's something to the effect that you know one person is a friendly visit from the ecumen, and three is an invading army. So in, in contrast with other novellas, we see this sense of, of real delicacy in how the ecumen approaches um, you know, wor words that, worlds that are not being, uh, that don't have a colonial sense, but that are being approached much more delicately in a way of you know, deferring to their own cultural sensibilities. And I'll conclude with that. Thanks so much for listening.